How's everybody doing tonight? Tonight, <laughs> today, man, I'm struggling already. Yeah, just uh, happy Sunday, getting ready for that holiday weekend. Just checking me out on uh, my YouTube, got me laughing. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, let me share my screen. I think I would have done that already, so. Just a little about me. I don't expect a lot of people to come holiday weekend. Just check out the replay. Uh, hope everybody's out there getting some sunlight exercise. I'm in the Midwest, and it's a decent day for once. <laughs> a decent day. So I'm hoping to get a walk later myself. So Okay, let me see. I think I like that one better. Let me see if I need to move it around. Uh, once again, look, most people know me, uh, Professor Black Ops. I've been in IT for 30 years. I've been in cybersecurity, yeah, about 15. I was just say 10 plus. So uh, we hit in AWS. I've been studying for my certs. Uh, it's going pretty good. One of the big dog certs. So it's gonna, you see the uh, thumbnail, AWS Incident Response Tabletop Exercise. And it's 861. Most people know I do federal compliance, so uh, I do a lot of NIST 800 stuff. So one of the things is you have to do an exercise every 12 months or 18 months, depending on which um, compliance you're doing. So we're going to get started here shortly. Um, let's see. So once again, if you have any cybersecurity questions, just drop them in the box and we will hit them. Um, like I said, just going back and forth. So, oh, great, get started. So just checking on my phone, okay. Salute to him. What's going on, man? <laughs> Glad you could make it. It's a great day in the Midwest. I thought you'd be out. I probably could go give me a little barbecue for tomorrow. <laughs> I'm lazy. I don't feel like cooking. But uh, once again, AWS Incident Response Tabletop Exercise. We do a light one. Um, when you get into cybersecurity, especially uh, federal, you have to uh, do a exercise when you get hacked. Um, different scenarios. So we just go over um, a pretty basic scenario. Once again, if you got any cybersecurity questions, just drop them in the box. Um, I slid AWS in there because I've been studying for, for my search, so I've been going pretty hard. So, uh, And AWS is pretty hot, so I do a ton of that. What's up, my manager, Brian? What do you think about Seth Green getting NFT stuff? I saw that, man. You got to be careful, man, with cybersecurity. You would think he could hash the uh, NFT so if somebody stole them, you couldn't sell them because you know they're 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 assets, right? Part of NFTs is get some of that on the blockchain, so you know they couldn't be stolen, so you know who their original owner was. But that those cybersecurity streets are, are dangerous out there, man. People are um, just stealing a ton. I think I'm on the wrong side, man. This is like you can easily steal a hundred million dollars real quick with people. Shout out to self. I feel bad, but. People just don't take security very seriously. So that's my take on Jabron, man. People got to be careful with the <laughs> mean out there. It is, man. You trying to make it and they trying to steal it. So uh, once again, we're going to go through a quick incident response. And for all listening, listening, um, if you have a business, do incident response and still do incident response. Uh, in your life, like I always do. Um, and I'll do one for the, I call myself the hood prepper. If the lights go off, what's your incident response? Can you can you roll with two weeks without no power? Do you got some water? <laughs> do you got, Jabron ex-military, so I'm sure he's good. Do you got some rations? Where you gonna eat? You know, if you somewhere hot in this middle of the summer and your uh, electricity go out, you got a fan, you gonna burn up. Can you go in your basement? Like my basement's cool, even in the summer when it's hot, right? It's less hot, right? So what's your personal response for um, your personal life? So we just gonna go over with AWS, but I'll do one. I call myself the hood prepper. So if stuff happens, you know, from an incident response, how, how are you gonna be able to deal with it? 
Jackson. So once again, if you look at NIST 800-161, shout out to Brian. I do a lot of NIST in government and I work at DOD. So you have to practice, I think DOD is every year. I do a lot of IRS work. You got to practice every 18 months. You got to write it up um, and you'll see it. My ex-boss is NSA, so he call it a hot wash. I call it a post-mortem, right? So at the end, when we do our um, tabletop, it's basically a paper walkthrough. When we do our paper walkthrough, I let some stuff out, and we can talk about it at the end. These are the things we need to add to get better, right? Every time you do the practice, you should get better. Uh, folks going to hit more cyber. Less, more cyber. That's what I tell people here, man. I ain't trying to be uh, giving the, uh, the slash pookies and ray rays any in in information, but you can steal $100 million without leaving your house, man. <laughs> Why would you go out there and get shot at, right? So, so I don't know why you why you would do something like that. But we need to get works uh, smarter, not harder in the criminal realm. I'm gonna leave that. I'm gonna leave that alone. Him, you can hit a hundred million dollars without leaving your house, man. Why, why, why would you go out with with a gun and get shot at, man? So we're gonna talk about incident response. You said I, I like it, right? Once again, I do federal work, so uh, part of incident response, I have to get together with the C-suite and different business units, right? And we go over if this particular business unit got hit with a cyber incident, how would it flow? And we'll talk about what's the communications. I've been called at uh, 1 a.m. in the morning talking about we've been hit by cyber. So what's the play? Who do you call? Um, and people don't realize this is security cannot touch shut down a system. <laughs> We can, but that's like number 10 on the list. Usually we got to call the business owner of that system, uh, assess the issue, right? If we're leaking data, <laughs> right? Uh, I can't really shut it down, right? The business owner, right? Um, I work the business where they were getting a um, billion dollars in three months. They might like, hey, the data's gone. We got to get this money. <laughs> we, we not worried about what's happening. We need to get this money before we shut down the system, right? So you got to reach out to the business owner and we'll talk about that. And that's what we go through with the business owners. What what system is that? How much money does it bring in? We call it MEFs, which is Mission Essential Functions. Where does that rank at? Right? Can we shut it down? Sometimes there's statutory requirement, legal re requirements. And depending on, you know, that could be the um, backup for the hospital now on backup power right so we wouldn't want to shut it down so you gotta uh do an assessment of what system and reach out to the business on in your documentation as part of cybersecurity, you should you should have that listed though right this is the system this is what it's used for um this is the time of year where it collects money uh this is a super critical system it connects these other three systems and they make all the money. We can't take it down, right? But those are the things you have to figure out when you do your incident response test. Right? And the first one, we tabletop is paper. Let's talk about, let's get everybody in the room and, and go through it, right? So part of incident response is uh, AWS, right? You got identity and access management, detective tools, of course, in the middle is infrastructure protection data uh, protection and incident response right in red is infrastructure that's all your servers your networking uh aim um all of that's part of the infrastructure right so everything really sits on top of that right so that's when that's part of the exercises once again you got to know which is your mission essential functions and how are you going to deal with them right and some past data breaches um that's um, oh, but they were huge. A lot of people got fired, right? So uh, this is 2019. First America Financial Corporation uh, records, 885 million, right? I'm going to just roll that up to a billion. We write there, right? Uh, it was bank accounts, bank statements, mortgage, tax records, social security numbers, wire transactions, receipt, and driver's license images. Uh, damages charged from the New York State Financial Services who attacked, they don't know yet. This data breach was unique in the sense that there was not a data breach in the company's service, but an authentication error, meaning no authentication was required to view documents. Uh, there were a common web uh, design area called insecure direct object, which basically means anyone who searched the direct link will have access to it. 
Once the single link is found, cyber uh, criminals use advanced persistence bots to collect and index remaining documents. This error went uncovered for years. The uh, New York uh, DFS alleged First America failed to follow its own business policy, neglecting to conduct a security review or a risk assessment or flawed computer program. What's up, Sparks, man? <laughs> Glad you can join us on this great day. So once again, uh, First America got hacked. Um, they didn't do a risk assessment or a security review. That's one reason we do the uh, incident response to kind of do the review for your system. And I, I should have looked up. I'm sure they got fined heavily. If you had a big mistake like that, you forgot to add authentication or it was broken and you didn't figure that out for years, right? And you lost the $885 million records. So that's why you should always do a security review or risk assessment. Man. One of my many jobs is, is I review software coming into the uh, government agency I work. We try to review every software that, that comes into uh, the agency, right? So we we won't be seen at least as negligent. Uh, Equifax, that was one of the uh, other big ones. That was 2017. That's a little old. It's compromised social security numbers, birth dates, addresses, uh, in some cases, driver license number. Damages 700 million to help people affected by the data breach, rep reputational damage and risk, and congressional inquiry. So I think their fine was uh, 700 million, and I think they had another uh, 100 million in just buying people credit monitoring. Cool thing about Equifax, right? They do they give out credit monitoring for a living, right? So that's just part of what they do. All right, still unknown and uh, application vulnerability in one of their websites led to the breach. The breach went undiscovered for months. The company has been fought by a number of security and response lapses. The application vulnerability being prime among them. Adequate, adequate uh, system segmentation made lateral movement easy for attackers. The sensitivity of the compromised information is that a breach makes it uh, particularly unique. All right, because <laughs> Equifax is where, where you get your um, your credit scores, right? And they give your information to the bank when you get loans. So theoretically, whoever stole that data can take a loan out in, in your name, right? Because they have all the information. I think they they had like half the uh, United States information as far as credit monitoring stuff. So that's what made it unique. So that's one reason because these breaches, you need to try to do an instant response and, and be prepared uh, when you get hacked. So at least you won't be floundering. Shout out to engineering cannabis. Bank data, bank data is valuable, not because of credit card, but also information every right. Now, that is true, engineering cannabis. That, that's probably the, the bigger piece, like you said, uh, individual spending hab habits and personal data. And they had it for half the United States. So once again, that's what made it egregious, <laughs> right? So let's uh, get the, so this is the tabletop and this is what we're gonna do our exercise on the day as we walk through it, right? To prepare so we won't be looking back. So the tabletop exercise, the security incident preparedness, taking tip participants through a process of dealing with simulated incident scenarios, providing hands-on training for participants that can highlight flaws in the incident response planning. Since most companies are unprepared when a cyber attack occurs, every company is a well-executed incident response plan. You do not want to wait until a cyber attack occurs to figure out what you need to do. Right, so this is what we're gonna do with the tabletop today. All right, we're gonna go through the scenarios so we'll be prepared so we'll know what to do. So on your uh, normal incident response team, and like I said, I do this probably three or four times a year. Uh, you got your technical team, your IT team, your uh, security team, and the developers of whatever system got hacked, right? So I'm security. I do compliance. I haven't wrote the code, and I can't patch the code. So like we saw the other two, if some incidents come by and says, hey, that um, web application is insecure, I have to get with the IT team to get those vulnerabilities closed. Um, so I've had... I've had to close vulnerabilities before because it was 1 a.m. and I'm very familiar with a lot of programming languages, right? And uh, I can patch most uh, web servers and app servers, so I've done that in the past. But theoretically, you're going to get the tech 
the technical team involved, right? Because hopefully they could have other systems that have the same vulnerability, right? So you're going to have your executive sponsor. I call it the C-suite. Um, depending, of course, how big it is, right? If somebody stole a laptop, I'm not going to get the president of the company in because somebody got their laptop stolen. But it, like Equifax, if the whole database of half the United States got stolen, uh, you're going to need to wake the president of the company up. And I have president of the companies tell them to wake them up. So I'm studying for the AZ900. What is similar certifications for that? Uh, I think the security architect, I need to look at the... Um, <clears throat> what the actual AZ-900, but if I remember, I think it's the same thing as the uh, security architect on the AWS side, right? But both the AZ and the AWS, they got a ton of um, certs. I was actually thinking about engineering cannabis because AWS has the uh, data analytics and now they actually have the um, machine learning certificate, uh, especially for AWS that made me think of engineering cannabis, machine learning. Then the incident responders, um, depending on what type of incident it is, if it's somebody stole a laptop, I'm the incident responder, right? I respond. We put in a police report so we can get reimbursed from the laptop from insurance. We file it depending on the uh, programmer and their boss. We might have them take some uh, security training, right? Some more communi communication coordinators. Um, once again, I work for a big <laughs> state government, and uh, we actually have an internal communication team, and it came up that if we lost this one database, we would actually, true story, have to call the governor's communication team because that's so big, our communication team wouldn't do it. So our communication team would have to talk to his communication team. Why? Uh, if you lose a database that big, that would actually uh, roll up to the governor, and he would have to have input on that. Forensic analysis, uh, part of the incident response team, too, is some of those um, skill sets we just don't keep on, on that. So I would do uh, basic forensic analysis to get it started. But once you start doing real forensic knowledge and dumping memory and dumping registers and looking at log files to see where the file got stolen to, what, what, what geographical area, right? I, I don't do that, right? So we actually have forensics. I'm going to holler that forensics people that we will work with um, to an external consultant. Um, we do business with other people, right? So if we get hacked, it could get one of our vendors hacked, right? So that's why you have to deal with external consultant and external clients. I'll put that at part of your third party risk, right? So one of our third party that we send data to, they might send us a file that, you know, could have malware on it or zero day on it, right? So that third party, and we're going to it, right? It's called coordination. I got AWS sites up. I could get hacked. It calls AWS to get hacked, right? So you have to communicate depending on if it's third party, internal, external, all that communication needs to be together. Right? And legal representation, because sometimes if we set down a system or uh, if we get hacked, or a lot of states have states general attorneys. If you get over 100 records uh, stolen or possibly stolen, you have to report to that state general attorney. Right? So we're going to work with our legal team to make sure we report to who's, who we should report to. And right then two is uh, we might have to give credit monitoring, right? So we're going to reach out to our legal team. Um, some of the time it's in a gray area, right? We didn't get hacked, right? It's called spillage. We have sensitive information, but it's in the wrong system. And that system's not secure for that information. So we'll reach out to our legal team and figure out what is our reporting requirements for a legal standpoint, right? Legally, they might tell us we don't have to, but morally, we might report to them, right? Because it might be one of our second party vendors or third party vendors. If we get hacked, of course, we want to let them know, right? That's just good uh, stewardship of the, of the business, right? Once again, we were just talking about that on the screen. Incident response, uh, those are the uh, entities we communicate with, so. Let's see what uh, engineering firms now using data to track. We create the incident through facts. And I got a couple picture slides because a lot of times, too, and I got a picture of that. Um, and I'm going to start talking more about automation of uh, cybersecurity. So if we know a VM is hacked or have malware on it, right, we want to hit a button to make a copy of that uh, VM, take that other VM and quarantine it to make sure none of that spreads. 
he did a setup for when our forensic and that forensic analyst come on site, right? He has a copy of the VM. We've done a hash to make sure it's not. We dumped all the memory and all the uh, um, data registers so he know what it looked like when the actual attack got discovered, right? That's part of having automation from a forensic standpoint, right? I'm able to register free after sending one of the Azure train. That's cool. Oh, good luck on that, man. <clears throat> yeah, shout out to that, man. Um, Everybody needs to get that free training, especially if you're talking about Azure, AWS, 800-pound gorillas in there. Uh, we know what um, uh, architects, security architects, I'm sorry, cloud architects makes, cloud um, DevOps, cloud uh, uh, DevSecOps. Uh, there's just so many jobs in there now, right? So, uh, so yeah, you got to get that training. And cloud is, you know, I, I'm... I'm not gonna say the future. The cloud is now. If you're not in the cloud, right, you're you're behind, right. So once again, the incident response in the middle. We're gonna talk to our customers, constituents, and media, other incident response teams. Once again, so if I get hacked, right, and I'm doing business with another client and we trading files, and I think I had a virus on a file I sent them, right, I need to call the other company's incident response team, right, to make sure you know we're all good. It's internet service providers incident reporters, law enforcement, uh, software and support vendors uh, too, right? Um, Caseus was a big hit, right? So we need the Caseus needs to let us know, which they did. They let everybody know you could be in danger, right? So incident response team could activate, right? Do we have that version of Java? Do we have that version of that software? Where is that version of the software? What's connecting to that software? What systems, right? But you got to get that information from the software vendor, right? That's why communications is uh, paramount. What up, what's up, game over? Glad you can join. That was messed up. A lot of people, they know they were, they, they don't know where at least this was true. So, yeah, so, um, so that's why you need to be in communication. Once again, I work for a large state agency. So we uh, actually have a external communication team that would talk to media if we had a large hack or a large incident, right? And most large companies have that uh, lined up. You actually want to practice that too. Who do you call and what what do you do when that happens? Shout out to Network Bro. <laughs> my guy. Shout out to him. I always check my man out, uh, networking, check him out. He's labbing every day. Maybe not every day, but he labs a lot. So go check him out. So part of incident response team, right? We're gonna do preparation, detection, and analysis, containment, eradication, and recovery, and post incident activity, right? So part, and we'll talk about that. What is the post incident? And uh, what do you do? We call it post mortem. Just go over what happened, what you could did better, uh, and if and if something happens, right? You, brought, you might need new software, new process and procedure, or something you just totally missed. Right? That's one reason you practice with the um, tabletop, right? It's paper. Uh, once again, we were just talking about that. Um, you got incident response team. You got coordination team at the top. A lot of times I'm coordination, right? I got a, uh, I work for a large state agency, so I have an on-prem private cloud vendor, and we do work, and they communicate with a uh, AWS vendor. So if something gets hacked in there, right, I got to figure out who's responsible for what happened, what's our reporting requirement, and we'll talk a little bit more. Who should I let know? Do I need to wake the governor up, right? So that's part of the coordination team. Now with, and uh, shout out to Network Bro, you got networking on-prem, you got networking in the cloud. It looks like one network, right? So when you get hacked from an incident response, Right. Shout out to Network Bro. He's excellent. I might have to call him at 1 a.m. and get him out the bed and be like, hey, man, we get a lot of network traffic from all prem. What, what the hell's going on, man? Is that us or is that them? Are we getting denial of service attack? Is that coming from all prem or off? I'm cybersecurity. Some of that um, instrumentation, especially on a Cisco router, I don't have access to. Right. I got some stuff and I got some some dashboards, but sometimes I need to get the network vendor out of bed because I got to figure out what's going on. And part of that could be is we need to shut down on-prem to talk to the cloud. The cloud is doing a denial of service attack. So we need to break our VPN tunnel 
or our VPN network or however we click or our direct connect, right? So I got to get with network, bro. And I'd be like, hey, I need you to shut that down so we can figure out what's going on, right? And hopefully, and we'll talk about that. A lot of that, though, you can automate, all right? You can tell a denial of service attack when you're getting 100 times more data traffic than you're using, right? A lot of that should be automated, right? A lot of that should, um, especially in the cloud, shut down that network, uh, shut off that security group. Shut off that knackle until we figure out what happened. Right? A lot of that could be um, automated. There's analysis. Test analysis containment really closely working. Oh, facts. All of that is together. <laughs> All of that is super close together. Right. And like I said, a lot of times I'm preparing that for when, like we said, I'm calling uh, our resource we got off site to do that type of forensic work because most people don't have that talent. Once again, on staff, you, you do it. So. We'll look at it. And um, <clears throat> incident response, the same thing with the juries. It's a shared responsibility, right? The customers have some responsibility. Uh, AWS has some responsibility. Some of it's crossover, right? And some of that security is mine and some of it's theirs. And some of it's both of ours, right? So we need to figure out that's what we practice, right? So if, if this happens, is that uh, mine, AWS, or both of ours together? Right, so you 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 don't want to be trying to figure that out why, why data is leaving your office, right? So here's our scenario, something super easy, and I happen to be studying it, so I put it on there. So we're gonna do an AWS cloud compromise. An administrator usually uh, administrator user accidentally exposed his access keys, secret keys to a public support form. The user notified the security team about the incidents after removing the exposed credentials to the form. Right, so that's actually more common than you realize. A lot of people upload stuff to forum and Reddit, and they, which is cool, they doing um, uh, code snippets and and code samples. But in their code samples, they forget they actually have secret keys and access keys, which means those keys act like you as a person, and they automatically log on the system. That happens a ton of stuff out here, right? So. <clears throat> So as part of that, once again, the administrator uh, left out the keys. He figured it out or somebody found it out on the forum. So just to get off, what initial steps should a security engineer take to mitigate the exposure without interrupting operations? So since those are keys, when you connect, they give you temporary credentials for you to do your work. You're going to invalidate the temporary security credentials and you're going to delete any access keys and secret keys that were actually out there, right? You can recreate them, right? This uh, create a second access key. I put that in red. Let me move my big old head out the way. Create access. Create a second uh, access keys. Uh, modify your applications to use the new new keys. Disable the access and key and check applications by working correctly before deleting the old keys. Because a lot of times those keys are used in multiple places. So when you um, create your new keys and you disable your old keys, right, and you start using the new keys, hopefully you have some automated tests or some kind of process that could go through and check to make sure everything's working the way it's supposed to work, right? So if you're at a big corporation and I send them, you got 100,000 lines of code, and where are these keys used? Are they used just in one place? Or they just use for you to work, right? And that's one thing you need to test in your operations. And as people start coding, those are the questions you need to ask your development team, right? So now we slide more into DevSecOps, right? I'm working with the development team. We're like, hey, when we use these credential keys, right, we need to make sure when we disable them or delete them, they're just for you to work, right? A lot of times they use keys for other EC2s or VMs to connect to a database or make a call, right? So when you delete these keys, do you know every place they're being used, right? So that's part of the exercise to make sure we, we do that and, and, and know that. <clears throat> and see, so I'm sure you know, talk about data role. All I hear is right, right, true. Um, that is true. I think penetration along with hacking, we talked about that a lot of engineers. That's the sexy part of things, right? When you talk about data analytics, even from a cybersecurity perspective, what does that mean is... <clears throat> Mission essential function. Where is most of our traffic going through? Where is most of our money going through? What is our high value box, right? 
what what is pointing outside to the internet that's probably going to be the most things to get hit where are most of our requests coming from right so that's how you do data data analytics because you need to know those numbers so you know what to protect because i always say money's not infinite right so if money's not infinite right you got to be able to figure out best where to use your money so so here's some other questions we're going to ask at in our in our um tabletop exercise right does your organization have current policies for third-party cloud? Should your organization still be held accountable for a data breach? Right. So in the end, that's when we talk about if we lose these people's data, are we getting sued? Are we going to have a class action lawsuit? What do we need to put in place maybe to mitigate that? Right. Um, right. So those are the questions you need, you need to be asking your legal legal team. What actions and procedures would be different if this was a data breach on your own local network? Right. So if this is in the cloud, but what happens if it's on prem? What should management do? What, if anything, do you tell your customers or constituents? How will, how and when would you notify them? All right? Instant response, uh, threat actor, we call it an external because our, our admin left the keys in a, an external forum, right? Um, assets impacted, those are our cyber security controls. So, two is a lot of companies. What's your legal obligation to your customers? Um, I work for the government. I do a lot of IRS work. So they said if we see anything with 24 hours, even if we think we've been hacked, the IRS wants to know. <laughs> right? So we have uh, reporting requirements. And two is most states now, states to general attorney, especially when you're in California with GDPR, they're going to tell you um, if you got hacked, how many hours you need to before you need to let them know. If you don't let them know in that time frame, you're going to get a big fine. Right? So that's part of the I always call this the management part of cybersecurity, right? Policies, procedures, reporting, how do we do, who do we report to, who do we let know, right? What's our command structure, right? Because as a organization, especially a high earning organization, you got to have all that figured out. Right? So um, this is a standard diagram for AWS, uh, three tier application load balancer. That blue there is a ASG, um, which basically, when you get so many hits on a web service, auto scaling group, it uh, spin up more web servers, take them down. Same thing for the app tier. And at the bottom is your databases, right? So what we try to do, we want all the good stuff, so security stuff to be in a database. We don't want it to be <laughs> on VMs and Unix that's getting auto scale and moved out, right? Because usually when a hacker comes in, they're going to get on the public network and work their way down to the database, right? So we want to make it hard for them to get down there, right? So this is kind of a standard setup you would do for a company in AWS. Right? Private 53 zones is where you get your keys for your website. Once again, database, application server. I'm a Java guy, so it would be Tomcat. Uh, IIS is if you're a C-sharp guy. Uh, at the top would be Apache if you're doing... Uh, PGP, uh, Ruby on Rails, right? So that's where you would put your applications, right? As a um, cybersecurity guy, DevSec guy, we need to understand our infrastructure and, and how it's moving. The part we just talked about too on there is uh, mission essential functions. What value do you put on each one of those servers, right? Some servers are just going to have HR documents. And the database is going to have, you know, SSNs, credit card, bank account numbers, right? So each one of those servers should have a value in how much you put in to protect it, right? So, so at the top, we talked about the actual administrator leaving their keys in there. So what would you do? So part of that is um, instant response. You would go to your IAM console, uh, go to your admin, allow services. So at the top, the ARN is the person's ID that got their keys stolen. At the bottom, your services, it tells you what they, all the things they had access to, right? So when, when, when some gets stolen in the quick, okay, this person left their keys or their password got hit, put their ARN, is their uh, access advisory, what did they have access to? It tells you, um, if you look, what when was the last time they logged on? Let me move my big head out the way again. At the bottom, it tells you last access time. So you can say, okay, they lost their keys then. When was the last time this uh, service was uh, logged into, right? 
right? Identity Access Management Console. So that's the place, you know, and two is called a run book. So as I develop this, there's a ton out there. If this happens, what's the steps you need to do to check it out? Once again, AWS, you're going to hit the admin console. Uh, the IM, you're going to have the access advisory, and it's going to tell you, okay, these are the things that, that those keys or that person logged on um, at that time, right? So that'll give you a feel, of, okay, do I need to look at that? It Was that a problem? Did somebody access? And when did they access? You know, the other part a part of that too is uh, they have a policy simulator a policy is actually how you get access to some it's just really the rules and rights before you get to that so as part of the again once again on the IAM I put the selected user in for those keys in that policy uh, EC2 is basically a uh, small virtual machines that spun up with stuff so i could say with that user with those keys ec2 is what they usually work on what can they have access to right so the people so the things it'll tell you these uh actions will be denied with those keys right so the thing i would do is i would bring up is what's not denied right okay these 20 things are not denied so i need to go look at a database whatever right but with those two reports is how are we going to get started to do our incident response and to do our uh, scope of work right because when you get hacked depending on that user's level it's a business user it or network bro right he's got access to you know all the routers but we could put a circle around and say okay these are the things that person has access to these are the things we need to do our uh, incident response on right? we don't need to do it on our whatever a thousand vms or if we got 20 vms we only need to look at these two right so those are the first two things i'm going to look at and start start moving right on this thing the other part of that too is when you do that you get um temporary credentials so at the top it says invalidating security credentials another approach is to temporarily attach the following denial policy so i know what that person has access to um, I'm going to do a denial policy for that users and keep the policies in place for 36 hours, the maximum lifespan for temporary credentials. You can attach to this to an additional policy to a users. It denies all, ac all access to that users regardless of permissions. After 36 hours, all your um, temporary security tokens will be expired, right? So I put that on that user and basically you basically said deny all actions to our researchers he can't do anything he needs to sit down for a minute why would i do that i need to lock down his access because i don't know if somebody's using it i don't know if somebody's got the keys and the thing we just looked at from the other um hacks is did somebody get his information and do a privilege escalation or do a prison uh privilege horizontal meaning they got on this role and jumped into another role right and start moving around our system so first thing I want to do is lock this down as I do my investigation, right? Once again, the part of your run book, part of you understanding what you need to do to uh, to do that, right? One of the big deals is CloudWatch is a monitoring and observers, uh, observability service built for DevOps developers, SREs, managers, and product owners. CloudWatch provides you with data and actionable insight to monitor your applications respond to system-wide performances, uh, changes in optimized resource. CloudWatch collect, monitors, operational data, and form of logs, metrics, and events. So that's what I'm going Basically, that's your SIM. It's a short-term uh, SIM. It keeps a lot of uh, activity and logging any of your operations, right? So some hacks, that's the first thing I'm going to start. Once I lock it down, once I figure it out, I'm going to look in the logs for those services that were available and try to figure out, okay, did somebody use that person's keys from a different IP than normal to attack us or, or, or try to do something, right? So, and once again, CloudWatch there, you got, uh, it's got your dashboard, but you got your database feeding into it, your containers feeding into it, your Lambda, auto scaling, EC2, uh, whatever you got, you probably gonna have that, hopefully you're gonna get that feeding in the CloudWatch. Once again, CloudWatch is short term. You have that feeding in your SIM. But if you're a small company, you know, I think you get a month of uh, logs in there. You got what you got. So that's the first place you're going to start doing your forensic analysis on it. Right? 
once we lock down a user, figure out what, once again, what services were available. The CloudTrail is uh, similar to CloudWatch. It's an AWS service to help you enable governance and compliance operational risk. Action taken by users, roles, or AWS uh, services are recorded in events in CloudTrail. And, uh, events include actions taken on AWS Management Console, Command Line Interface, SDK, and API. Uh, CloudTrail is enabled at your AWS account when you create it. Right? So CloudWatch is basically your users moving in and out. CloudTrail is API, right? Everything is API-based. So if you're doing an API call for a service or a user or a web service or something else, that's going to put in CloudTrail. And we put those together, right? We should have a, a total view, total view of everything, right? In CloudTrail, you got your management console, you're in there using it to connect. And your CloudTrail could go to your uh, S3 bucket, all right? Then you could uh, save those uh, logs for additional use. Right? And when you get to a big company, you're going to have a sim. You're going to take your cloud, watching your cloud trails, put them together, right? Because with both of those, you can get a total view of your organization inside now when people get in there. And two is you want to protect this because as a hacker, that's one of the first things I want to get to and delete, right? So, so AWS cloud trails, you can use the event. You can use cloud trails to search for the last 90 days. Uh, you can do filters. Um, you can do drop downs. We can look for those AWS access keys we lost and see if they were doing any API calls, right? So it's cool. So once again, another resource we would use to, once again, once we lock those out, we start digging to figure out was those keys used in the sum or try to get something to where it wasn't. So the difference between CloudWatch and CloudTrail, CloudWatch is monitoring service that gives you the visibility and performance and health of your AWS resources. Cloud Trails is a service that logs AWS account activity and API usage for risk auditing, compliance, and monitoring. So those are the two differences of it, just at a, at a high level. But once again, you you need both of those when you're really digging in from a forensic or trying to figure out what happened, right? So Cloud Trail versus Cloud Watch. So once again, they all over the uh, AWS cert test though. Uh, then once again, looking to the cloud uh, trail, last 90 days, see, uh, I highlighted. So I would be looking stuff for the access key that got that was on the forum. I will look for the access key ID and once again, figure out what that user was using for, uh, who used it, right? What account ID you used. So I will be looking in cloud trails for that access key ID. Once again, to try to figure out if somebody took advantage of those keys that was left by the administrator. Well, if we fire somebody and for some reason their access keys come back in, hopefully we would delete those and drop those, but sometimes people forget, right? So we would be able to go on cloud trails with that access key ID and kind of figure out what that person did. Once again, we just kind of going through a high level um, tabletop exercise paper. So these are the things we would talk about in the meeting. Okay, this is what we would do. This is how we would do it. This is what we will use from uh, AWS reporting requirement. We would we would use this policy. We would invalidate these keys. Shout out to Kev Tech. I appreciate the $10 super chat. I'm going to go get me some barbecue, uh, Kev Tech. I got to lose some weight, but it's Memorial Day. <laughs> Shout out to Kev Tech for chipping in on a barbecue. <laughs> um, and, uh, thanks for helping the young lady I sent to you. <laughs> she was super excited. <laughs> so. Uh, once again, get to the cloud trail. We were good in cloud trail. We would look for the access ID, right? So even if we had a junior cybersecurity person, right, we would put them, okay, I need you to do this. I need you to go on IAM. I need you to put the access ID in. Of course, um, cloud trail is going to do this. It's going to bring out the, the data, but sometimes I need a junior person to uh, consolidate all that data, right? Because we go on a cloud watch. We go on access. I'm getting the uh, forensics available. I'm talking to management. Like we said, I'm talking to president if all the database got stolen, right? I'm talking to legal, right, from a high manager. Okay, this is what business unit gets hacked. You know, they always on you, right? They're going to wear you out. So I'm telling them, hey, this is what we know right now. This is what we got. This is the report. A lot of times, too, is especially when I get part of reports, I like to send them the management because management wants to see you moving. Even if it's not a big move, that keeps them off your back, right? So I tell the junior person, 
print this out. I need you to consolidate. Send the first um, 10 pages to the incident response team. We looked at them. Legal, uh, management, security, the business. You send them 10 pages, right? That's going to get when they get stuff in their hand, they're like, oh, okay, they, they're doing something, right? Because if you don't, they're going to call you every hour to figure out what's going on, right? So you send them that, they're like, oh, you know, you just give them a high level. Because management doesn't want big, you give them a paragraph. This is the ID, this is the access ID. This is where they're at. This is the services they're using. This is what we see in the, uh, the sim right now, right? How can I monitor the kind of activity for a specific IAM role? Uh, once again, it was the cloud trails. Just I made it a little bigger so you can see that. That shows you the role they were using. Those are fake roles, though. But that's the role they would be using to get um, access to other services, right? So I could take that role and have the junior person to say, what role and what services does this role have access to that this principal I, key ID had access to, right? So once again, we walking through um, tabletop, just paper. But you, you want to know what you're going to do before you get hacked, right? So these are the steps at a, at a high level, what the uh, security team would do on an AWS hack, right? So just kind of rolling, just rolling through it. Then from a forensic standpoint, we figured out this instance right there. You see it isolated. We had a problem. It could have had malware. The keys that was lost were... Uh, Somebody logged on to this uh, instance, which is just a VM with those keys, and they weren't supposed to. So I'm going to isolate this VM. I'm going to make a copy of it, right? I'm going to take it off the network with a security group, right? And I'm going to give a forensic copy. So when the forensic guys come in, he's going to want to look at, like we talked about, the memory, the uh, registers, what was on that box, uh, uh, if it's SFTP and looking in the log to see where it sends stuff, so I got this already set up, right? It's part of the run, but hopefully this will be automated, all right? Um, because on the um, instances we put what team could access it, so we knew that key had access to this box. We looked and saw this um instance had act was accessed, so right, we made a copy of it, got it ready for forensics, right? Because, too, because when you order forensics or people come on site. You want to be ready. You want to be twiddling their thumbs or waiting around. Like, hey, I got you the box. We believe this is the the VM, one of the VMs that the person got on. It's forensically available for you. Here's your credentials. Log on and have at it, right? Two is I'm letting management know. We're letting the incident response team know. We're still looking through the uh, paper and the logs, right, trying to figure out what other things will happen. But right now, our first, you know, two or three hours, we figured out these uh, instances or VMs were touched by somebody with those keys. We got them ready for forensic analysis. We got the snapshot and we got them credentials to log into, right? So uh, instant restarts automation. So a well-architected multi-AWS devices structure for using organizations. And we look at a part of your structure organization for a big company. You want to have a security place and a forensic place already set up, right? Because you know you're going to have issues. You, you may not be hacked, but there's going to be things where you might need to feel like you've been hacked, right? So from a well-architecture AWS stuff, we're going to have that on deck to be ready for them, right? So at the top, we got the production, security OU, then we got the forensics OU, right? So security OU, this is where we review logs. We got the junior people. We got our security uh, tooling. We got our read-only. Shout out to... Um, Network bro, he probably gave me read only a little bit into the Cisco so I could see what's going on. Um, I could look at routers. I could look at some packets for maybe some particular IPs, right? Just read only, though. I'm not messing with them. And once again, you just saw it up here. Let me see. Uh, that's the forensic stuff. Once we know something happened, we can spin up in a, a forensic availability zone, get it set up for forensics to do their work, right? we well organized and we ready and at the top these are uh security uh control policies meaning depending on what happened in the organization i can lock everything down in production i can open up everything for security and i can open up everything for forensics right so that means um whatever security i have up there flows through the whole organization right 
So if I need to shut it down, I don't have to go through each individual user or account or this or that. I could go to a production ECP, just say deny, and then whole production shut down until we figure out what happened to it. Right? Sometimes we call it break the glass. If you need to shut everything down, how are you going to do it? And you need to be able to do it within 30 minutes, right? We are a large organization. How can you shut it down, right? So that's a well-architected um, infrastructure, right? And, and we're going to talk about that. I'm going to do more DevSecOps and DevOps and more security stuff with AWS on my channel. So um, people seem to like that. So And I like it. So and like I said, I'm learning a lot. So that's it. Then two is we can automate some of that, right? Amazon Guard Duty basically looks for threats. It uh, populates your security hub as a member. Your administrator, if something gets changed, like you got a file system, for some reason it's not encrypted and it should be, the security administrator can automatically tell Event Bridge to invoke a Lambda function, basically uh, gets that role for uh, security, takes the compromised incidents and creates all of that, what we saw. It can do all that automatically. And once it gets that information, it could put it in the evidence S3 bucket, right? So what is that? It's just really um, whatever you need for the forensic guy, you can give a bucket uh, that's part of that instance and get it ready for him, right? So like collector VM instance. So and you can automate a lot of that stuff. Right? So then that's where you really want to get to as you get more mature as an organization, you need more mature as a... Um, security person right you don't want to do stuff manually you, you want it to be automated right you want to be able to hit hit a button and like we just saw create your whole forensics OU, right you you can create it with a, a hit of a button right then you got the instance you got a quarantine you got a copy of it and you got it ready right all that should be automated so once again we don't be through twiddling our thumbs and wasting money right so one of the other things is aws system manager it automates capturing one method, includes SSM agent, uh, targets a run command through Amazon CloudWatch, events when an instance is tagged with a specific tag. For example, you can do response equal isolate plus uh, memory capture tag to affect the incidents. You can configure Amazon CloudWatch events to trigger it with two action. The Lambda function then performs an isolation activity. The run command and execute a shell command and exports your Linux memory through the SSM agent. So we'll go back up real quick. So what they're talking about, this part right here, it could be automatic, hit a button, all that gets built, all that gets copied. Once again, with those tags and that, it's going to flush out your memory, once again, to that bucket for you. And we'll work on that too. We're going to work on some automation and see what that automation will look like in, in, in real person, right? So now let's say we did it. We went through it. Um, and I've, I've actually been to a lot of tabletop and actually a lot of real things in real life. And this is what we do at the end. We call it postmortem or hot wash. What things could we done better, right? So from AWS Security Audit, we saw those two particular hats. What else, what's up, Anders? I'm glad you could join us. So what things we could do is review AWS account credentials more, review your AM users, your AM groups, your AM roles, your mobile apps and EC2, right? We saw on those um, particular hacks is one thing they got beat up was there were no security reviews. There were no overlooking. It seemed like they just spun up these apps and they never reviewed them from security, right? So from our postmortem, we want to make sure we review those things in AWS, right? Um, to make sure we're in compliance, right? And we, <laughs> we won't be considered negligent and get a big fine. <laughs> What's up, Miss Nash? Glad that you could check. There's no tardiness. You can always check out the replay, and it's a it's a holiday weekend. So once again, we want to review all our credentials, review users. When people leave, right, every three or four months, we want to take somebody that got um, offboarded. We just want to go through their their username, their roles, and make sure they're actually you know taking out the system. Their roles are disabled, and they're really taking out the system. I see a lot of systems where people think they got stuff deleted from people that were fired up or they still got active credentials right so you want to go back through there and, 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 and double check that that's something in the postmortem we want to do as a company right to make sure we, we were doing that those reviews and the other part of that instead of using long live aws credentials like access keys for aim role you want to consider using iam roles or aws federation 
The advantage of Rogue Federation is that you can use temporary security credentials. So there are uh, no long lived AWS credentials. So that's a big thing you want to federate get in. What's up, Wally? I'm glad you can join us. So that's one thing, right? You don't want to use those um, keys and SSH keys, right? You want to do uh, AWS roles where people can assume them. Then when they're done, they, they're done, right? So then when they leave, I just say in the, uh, when I take them out the IM or the Active Directory, right? They won't be able to assume these roles, right? They won't be able to get federated. So I don't have to physically worry about deleting keys, right? So that's one thing uh, this tabletop we would think about doing, right? So they won't become uh, protected protected or inadvertently exposed. If the credentials were exposed, had permissions or create modified delete company data, determine the effect associated with the access. For example, you might want to restore data from a backup or was maybe uh, before the credentials were exposed. We talked about this generated credential report in each account and organization. Consolidate report and identify the user's access keys and make sure you rotate those keys. Right? What's up, OG Patrice? The <laughs> you can join us. So, so two is we we show two or three reports. This is another report, uh, depending on your organization that you could print out that give you uh, information on the access ID keys. Right? We walk it through a tabletop, uh, which is basically paper. What would happen if this company got hacked? Right? So these are some things we're going to add to our run books on a feature when this happens. We know we need to get this additional report to management and the uh, entity access management team of what what they need to get rid of and what they need to uh, take out right so temporary se security credentials that were issued by the security token service may have been compromised security engineer needs to immediately revoke the tokens that cannot be used use the aws management code console to revoke active session token and i think we had that at the top but i just want to reinforce that when that happens in those keys you need to go straight to the console and delete those uh, active sessions because those active sessions could be somebody actually attacking. Because if they're in there attacking them and moving around and they have um, an active session, even if you delete those keys, that active session I think was good for 36 hours, depending on how long you uh, had those open. Right. So that's something as a as a company, right? You want to be on top of because. We always know they're going to be incident. I've been in a number of incidents. Most of them, they weren't actually hacks, but they look like hacks. So we had to get the reports, figure out what happened, make sure we take out their credentials, make sure we take out if anything was active at the time, right? So you got to go through those things, right? So, so you can show that that person and actually get into your system is still anything. Right? So two is, um, from a legal perspective, you don't want to be seen as negligent, right? If you've seen as negligent as a corporation, that's AKA big fine, right? So uh, reporting requirements, that's a new thing. I just did a video, depending on what type of company you have, what part of the government is, do you need to report to the state general attorney? Right? Even though I do a lot of IRS work for our state, um, they actually want us to report to the Department of Homeland Security if we get hacked. The reason why is if a lot of states are getting hacked at the same time, that could be a nation state, right? So if you look, Biden wants businesses and companies to report cyber incidents. That's one reason why, right? So if a lot of the same agencies are getting hacked across the United States, that would be considered a nation state. But if we don't report it to Department of Homeland Security slash CISA, which is infrastructure, they won't know, right? So we need to report them. Then two is if you're a hospital, you're going to report the health and hospital. Once again, I do a a lot of state taxes, government work, um, uh, child care actually reports to the IRS. So I guess it's called Pub 1075, purpose of education. So if you get hacked, do you need to report to a specific government agency? Right. A lot of companies, I do a lot of help with medium and small companies and they have no idea. Right. And that's one reason you want to reach out to your legal team to, to, to help you with that. Right. And with GDPR, which is spreading, it's in Cali, but a lot of states or new york is actually uh i think gonna start doing gdpr what is your reporting requirements if you get hacked from a state level okay federal state um leveled in two is what do you owe your customers right <laughs> your clientele um if you're if you get their information stolen right? so so once again that's it at a high level i just want to hit it up uh, once again i've been doing a lot of aws <laughs> studying so um 
Let's see. I'll drop the link. So um, once again, um, it's called NIST 161. It's uh, once again, people know I do a lot of federal work. It's just when you do federal work, you have to do a system security plan. And part of your system security plan is you got to test it. So they want you to actually have a formal test procedure. Then they want you to document it all because when you get out of it, and I get out of it a lot um, by major federal agency, they want to see that paperwork. Did you do the tabletop? What came out of it? What did you learn? Let me see your run book. What What are you going to do? When you did that, did you learn anything? The, port, the postmortem and high watch. They want to know that you got continuous improvement and you continuously get getting better, right? Um, shout out to Kev Tech. We laughing every day, working every day. We getting better as a person, right? So we so that's part of that is they want you as the company get better, right? And two is so um, I charge companies to help them do this because you get a lot of uh, medium-sized company trying to get federal work and the first thing is when they go do an rfp or rfi request proposal to do work sometimes they ask them from a system security plan as part of the system security plan they want to know um, how are you going to do an exercise and when you're going to do exercise and the cool thing is, is a lot of times is you we do exercises with our vendors right so if we got a check printing vendor or a vendor that we do files with, um, if it's something big for us, right? And then stuff, if we're down or they're down, we want to know if if we're down, we can send our disaster recovery site to yours and get them print. If you go down, I need to know you got a deal. Do you have a DR site, disaster recovery site, so we can continue to do business with them without any downtime, right? So that's one reason you do these incident response plans too. Right? So to make that happen, right? Yeah, shout out to uh, Kev Tech. He always on LinkedIn. <laughs> I see Kev Tech. I think I need to be doing a little more on LinkedIn. Shout out to Kev Tech. But that's one reason you want to do. Once again, it's this 806. It's just instant response and you practicing tabletop. And I'll do another video where you actually, where we actually going to take down a, a system and see it uh, fell over to your DR site, right? See it spin up. See, can you still do business? I see a lot of people do a digital site when they do it. The DNS, right, which is your your www. It's a thing where it has to uh, ping your primary sites that down, then automatically points to your secondary site. A lot of times, it's called TTL Time to Live. It never uh, <laughs> it never switches over to your secondary site. So even though you paid all that money and spun it all up, it never gets online because you, your DNS site never rolls over, right? So those are the stuff, the stuff you need to test, right, and make that happen. <laughs> I did not. That's not this <laughs> today, Digital Nomad. I'm going to do that with um, uh, probably Citizen Lou, Digital Nomad. And digital Nomad is not today, right? Uh, one of the other things I was going to talk about is uh, Digital Nomad with Citizen Lou. I'm sure a lot of y'all hip to him. He's in Mexico or some Latin country at the time. So how do you get... um? remote work and you'd be able to do it anywhere right the cool term of that is called digital nomading right so if you do um so um if i get a lot of remote work and i want to do it in mexico i want to do it in vegas right i could do it anywhere right as long as you got your laptop locked down we just did an instant response <laughs> right online right we didn't need to be person to person right? so um get used to it i did actually did a dr instant response for it was funny for a popcorn company in Chicago. I asked him, I was like, why are you doing a DR site? They go, the bank gave us $5 million. They want to know if something happened, we can tend to continue to make them popcorn and pay them their money back. So you'd be surprised how many smaller companies need DR sites and stuff. So that made sense. So I was like, oh, if I'm a bank, I want to make sure you can pay me my money back. So they want to see their incident response plan in DR. So, but theirs were more talking about if their plant caught on fire or if they had a they were down for a power cup for two or three days. What could they do to continue to make popcorn so they could continue to, to pay on their $5 million loan for equipment, right? What's your connection on LinkedIn, Black Ops Cyber Shoot, uh, shoot me some at Professor Black at gmail.com. I'll send it to you, Helmet. What's up, brother Michael? <laughs> I don't remember. It was probably been about six years ago, but it was, it was surprising to me. So uh, we talked about this other thing. It's called reciprocity agreements. Like one of their vendors were in Ohio. Um, so they agreed 
because I guess they needed one. So both of them didn't run third shift, so they could run third shift popcorn on each other's sites. And I guess they pretty much made the same type of popcorn. It was a little different. So I, I was amazed with that. I'm like, uh, I made about, so yeah, I made a little good money. So I had to run up to Chicago <laughs> and meet with them. So it's, it's amazing. But yeah, um, once again, most companies, you're going to need to do an instant response. You don't want to wait till the last minute. I've um, helped some people last minute and they don't know who to call. They don't know who to report to. They don't know their system. They don't know um, who had access to it. Right. And some of that is maturity. Right. If you're a large company, you're going to have Archers, Spiceworks. Um, um, Microsoft has so many things, too, where you have these things uh, documented already. Right? These are our uh, systems. These are because people put tickets in and get stuff fixed on those systems. Right. So that's part of the ticket system. So part of that is, too, is, OK, these are our system identified. If something happens, you know, what are we going to do for it? What's up, Titanium? Titanium. So, but yeah, so everybody, um, and two is even if your own job, even if your company's not doing it, if you are a shout out to, I keep bringing network, bro, if something happens, you need to have a plan in your head, right? If somebody hacks and you lose the, not personally, if you lose the admin's password on the Cisco router and somebody's using it, what's your instant response plan? How do you change it, right? So if somebody, you know, got into a certain module and used it, all right. How, how can you figure that out? Did somebody disable something that shouldn't be disabled? All right. Did somebody cut off some encryption that shouldn't have been cut off? They got something stolen. All right. So if somebody asks you those questions, you need to be able to have an understanding of this is what I need to do. This is how I'm going to figure it out. You know, this this is this is how I'm going to prevent it. Right. And two is I'm working on doing free IT support training for military. That's cool. Let me know if I can do anything for you with that uh, Kev Tech for the uh, veterans. Uh, long story short, I worked at uh, DOD, uh, and I was on a couple panels here. And that was there's a lot of veterans out there, you know, especially um, now that you can use your GI Bill for courses and boot camps and and other things. I think um, uh, that is definitely uh, necessary, especially if you're going to do it free. You know, that's that's even better. But they have a lot of resources. I just want to make sure GIs are using their GI Bill. Um, the most effective way and the most responsible way, right? Because I shout out to them too. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I did a video of a baby stealing. Uh, I ordered 31 cheeseburgers. Uh, lock your phones up, babies ordering cheese. You'll see me on the platform. That's cool. I saw I saw you. Uh, congratulations on your Udemy course. Uh, I'm sending people where it's <laughs> all facts. Yeah, facts. Um, but yeah, so because that's actually what's uh, what's needed. Um, I think, um, like we always know, there's a thousand ways to get in IT. Um, college, uh, it's not necessary. I mean, I think it can help in different ways, but there's a ton of myriad. And shout out to I heard my man talking today is the R the ROI on college is not what it used to be, right? So it really depends on degree and what you're trying to do. So. Um, and definitely for me, one of the ground floors to get in, um, especially if you're younger, but really no other thing is, is help desk, right? Cut your teeth on help desk. Um, help desk gets you, um, you get to know the players, you get to know the company. And, um, and two is, I'm old, man. I use those same help desk skills. I'm talking to CISO, CIOs. I use those same skills when I start on the help desk with those guys. Those guys are needy, they entitled, and they want their shit fixed now. So those same help desk skills, shout out to Ken Tech. I use them to this day, and I'm 50. I use them on the CIO and CEO because most of them are grumpy. Most of them got something to do. So it's just different level people, same same techniques, right? Um, so that so those 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 skills from the help desk too is because help desk like incident response is when people put a ticket it's usually a problem right so, and they want to fix now right so those skills are those skills are transferable right so uh i need to <laughs> that train. so so yeah so you so shout out to kev tech we always talk about soft skills because he came for restaurants and i'm sure he met i'm not gonna call ceos to see i was assholes but i'm gonna interview this guy i love him he's super grumpy and he's one of the hardest dudes we work with but 
you know, we have understanding and he put pressure on people, right? You had those type of guys, right? Those guys make money. Those guys make the company money and they need their stuff fixed now. A lot of times it's not personal, it's just business, but they can put a little pressure on you. So if you're familiar with your personal incident response plan for the technology stack you're using, you will not be surprised you won't be scrambling, right? Oh, definitely. I use those skills all day long, right? So any because any position you are, especially when you move up, especially when you get to a certain point, is once again, I'm not my I talk to CISO, CIOs. I'm have this a CISO on from a legend large state agency, right? And I, I advise him, right? So he, he comes to me, he wants a decent answer, right? We gotta figure it out, right? Sometimes it's under pressure because the CIO's asking him for some answers. Right, as a consultant, I gotta give him his um pluses and minuses, things he can do, things he can't do. Once again, we're talking to legal to make sure this is stuff we can do, or if if not, can how do we report it? Right. So all those people skills are always um transferable, and, you, and you're gonna need those, right? And so you know, those those are all good. So I'm hoping everybody's out tomorrow. Once again, I'm getting my study on and um Shout out to my man. Look in the chat. He was giving you those AWS uh, free courses if you like Azure. Shout out to Kev Tech. He's giving so many free courses. Shout out to um, Keep It Techie with the Linux free courses. There's so many people out there. Check out my man Black Heights. Um, uh, women in Linux. <laughs> There's so many people out there. Uh, I know I'm forgetting somebody. There's just so many people out there. Oh, yeah. Shout out to uh, Tech G textual chatter just so many guys especially out here i'm calling i'm calling the manosphere but just in general um i'm you know i'm i just try to support people like i said kev tech sent me a couple people to talk to so you know i always if, if i can help him i'm always gonna help him like i said i i got some young ladies some splunk credits i think so the uh, she talked to one of my splunk contacts uh, a lot of people want to splunk um uh, great sim if you can master it you can make a ton of money um so it's just it's out there i just trying to <laughs> I try to do tech training for women in tech shout out to you might as well do kev tech doing everybody in tech shout out to kev tech <laughs> Microsoft training. okay uh, and azure coming up in two weeks good luck with that there was some free training um i think helmet put in there helmet did you put that training in here helmet if you're still in there drop that did you drop a link for it i know helmet was talking about some free training I'm scrolling by uh I think it was helmet. But yeah, he was talking about some free Azure training um in there. Um, like I said, I'm in uh, I'm on the AWS. Yeah, yeah, Splunk. The only bad thing about Splunk, it's really not bad, is um one of my big clients, I mean they're huge. They said it was too expensive because they charge you by, by inject ingestion of the uh, log files. Man, log files get big, especially if you're talking about aws is your on-prem and i know some on-prem they got four thousand uh vms so you start um logging four thousand vms they were like uh yeah if you can help me if you got a second uh i stay online and uh drop that link to because i know you have some azure um free training in there uh like i said i um i like this one guy following on aws so i actually pay he was super cheap um i'm kind of worried i'm old so i kind of like this stuff so um, I'm probably going to sit for my, um, I passed the practitioner, so I'm getting ready for the AWS associate architecture, and I'm getting ready for the AWS security uh, specialty cert. So I'm going to take both of those, hopefully, in the next two months and knock those out. I appreciate the help. So, yeah, if you um, BBO, you look, took a uh, compliance role. Which, oh, good luck. I originally took, oh, you good? Hey, I've been doing compliance for 20. You don't need luck. You got me. Just. You got my email. If you get stuck, shoot me an email, man. You you don't, you don't need no luck. I, I got your back. I've been in that game for a long time. I've been doing this 853 RS Pub 1075 and HIPAA for 11 years. <laughs> so I got your back. If you need anything, just reach out. Um, I work with some killer policy writers a lot of times. I think that was the Microsoft Field Challenge. Okay, okay. I just wanted, but yeah, time, yeah. If you if you ever need anything in that, uh, especially if you're in the federal space, NIST, ISO, um, 
like I said, I'm doing I'm gonna do more compliance videos with AWS. They actually have services that do compliance checks for you. I'm gonna show those kind of like I did here. We're gonna walk through those to for the listener response to make sure those VMs, uh S3 buckets, uh <laughs> uh every SFX and all that stuff is locked down for compliance. We're gonna do some compliance videos. And but but yeah, if you 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 got my email, man. If you need anything in that realm, just reach out on that compliance game, man. Like I said, I've been doing that, especially if you're in a NIST ISO world. Uh, and I got a lot of templates for that too. So they start me out. Oh, that, <laughs> I'm an expert at Pub 1075 Titanium. Um, the IRS knows my name. I ask them so many questions. But yeah, let me know. I'm going to do a video on Mars Z's. Uh, let me know if you want to do We can do a um, collab on the Mars Z. I got videos. Um, Go to my channel looking back. I got a compliance playlist in there, Titanium. I go uh Pub 1075, NIST, uh Marzi, um, NIST 800 53 I'm actually reading NIST 800 53 R5 just been out a year, Titanium. Yeah, I eat and sleep that man. So I got your back anytime you want, or if you need me to get on a call with somebody, <laughs> whatever you need from me, Titanium. Uh, like I said, I, I live and eat that, man. So um Especially that 1075. I, I love that pub 1075 life, man. You can attend one of the eligible take with no cost later. Thanks for that. Uh, let's see. Oh, I thought I hit one. Let's see. 1075. Compliance. <laughs> yep, compliance. Because I know Gerald, uh, too, is a uh, titanium. I think I saw you. Ger I think his name is Gerald uh, Simply Cyber. He's got a super cheap course on compliance. I, that was that was gonna be my first course, but I think his course was so good. Check him out, Titanium. I think it's simply cyber. I seen Ked Tech over there a little bit. So shout out to uh, Erica. How you doing? Hope you enjoying your um no, no stop in. It's true. I've been studying for my AWS, so I look, look took a little time off. So yep, simply cyber. So yeah, I'll go check him out. Uh Titanium, he's good. He's super. He's got a PhD, so and I, he's got a working PhD. I work with a few PhDs. I don't think a program their way out of paper bag, but that dude is super good. Um, I'm I actually might want to. I think I'm gonna take his course just to just to see what it's like. Um, because even though I'm old, you can always get better. There's new things. I think he's on cutting edge. Uh, he does a lot of endpoint stuff too with security, and I don't I don't do that. So I think I would definitely learn something from him. But yeah. Kev Tech got up there, Simply Cyber Titanium. Uh, he has a course, and I think it, Kevin, correct, Kev Tech, correct me, I think you could pay what you want, or it was $25. It was super cheap. It was super cheap, so I was going to check him out. But, yeah, check that out, Titanium. Like, again, once again, if you got any uh, NIST or um, PUB 1075, um, um, I was talking about residual risk on one of my compliance uh, videos. But check out my compliance uh, playlist on there, Titanium. That we can get together if you never, if you ever need anything, just you got my email, just just, just hit me up. Uh, anybody's professor black ops at gmail.com. Uh, I used to be a professor, y'all gotta give me 48 hours to answer my emails. <laughs> I'm a little slow, <laughs> yeah. Let's see, Jared's pay, yep, pay what you can. So, yeah, so definitely check that out. Can can get it for free, yeah. Titanium, I would give him like $25 and check him out. He's good, he's he's super good, man. He actually has a morning. Uh, uh, threat briefing. Um, certain days it's eight o'clock Eastern, so I'm always at work in the conference room just checking him out. Two, if anybody needs um credits um, for continuing this education, if you listen to his show and put your name in his chat box, I think you get 10 credits a month. I don't know how many you got to listen to, but it just listen. And this show is excellent, a lot too. So, um, but yeah, check out uh, Simply Cyber, his um. He's good. That's the course I was thinking about doing. I'm like, um, I think I'm gonna do a dev sec ops course now, maybe, but I don't know. I know I see Kev Tech be putting in a lot of work. I'm old, man. I don't know if I want to put a course together, but now shout out to them. Like I said, I'm I'm winding down once again. Uh hmm. mine going to be the same. Pay what you can. That's cool. I think I might actually uh do that. Um he did a, um, like I said, he did a compliance course. I might do something on top of that, a little more 
NIST 800 that's 53 specific or pub 1075. Uh, Titanic pub 1075 is weird because that's actually reporting directly to the IRS. So I, I don't want to say you must be working for a big state agency. <laughs> Those are the only people I know reporting to the IRS, especially with Mars Z. So uh, I think I know what state agency you're working for. Probably, are you working for a vendor trying to get some of that work? Uh, I review a lot of those vendors trying to get into um, the state I work for, so I, I review a lot of uh, software too. So, and we can walk through that too. I think I'm gonna do a video on that, Titanium. How do you review software for a government agency? Right? So, your turn to make sure. <laughs> I see y'all killing it, man. I know, uh, continue this. <laughs> so. I can't take up trying, man. I got a few few things I got to get handled before I try to make a course. I'm barely making videos, man. You talk about a course. I got to get my video game. Like I said, once again, I've been studying for the AWS. It's been going pretty well. Um, the practitioner, shout out to Erica. She's the, the queen of all the certs. So I'm, I'm getting there, right? So, so it's all going good. So I think that's all I got for today. Shout out to Kev Tech. Thanks for the 10. I'm going to add that to my barbecue. I'm going to go get Oh shit! I think it closed at six. <laughs> I've been up. I've been home for an hour and a half. <laughs> no, shout out to that. I appreciate it. Um, once again, so um, you see me doing a lot more AWS stuff and just putting it. Uh, shout out to uh, Ty. I'm gonna do a little more um, federal compliance stuff. That's my bailiwick. That's usually how I make my money, especially in this 800-53 and IRS pub 1075. I've been doing that for probably 20 years. Um, when I was at DOD, I was actually um, a web server and app server admin, a DBA. And the checks we had to do to get that hardening was the STIGs and the CIS checks would roll up, which rolls up to PUB 275 and this, right? So I've been doing those for a long time. So I got Marsh Sheet. I got a Smart Sheet server. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> smart, what is Smart? Is that like an Excel? What is Smart Sheet? I don't, I don't know what that is, Eric. Get some food and joy. I appreciate that, man. But like you were talking, I gotta get better help. I gotta start. I gotta start walking again, man. This pandemic done got me messed up. <laughs> I want killing it. Hmm. Yeah, I feel you. Uh, like I said, I'm studying. I'm trying to. I don't know. I'm. I'm. I'm getting credits on AWS. I want to get my associate architect, my uh, security cert, my. Um, I think they had a developer cert, and I was going to get the um, database cert. I love databases, man. That's my first look. Appreciate you, game over. Okay, shout out to Eric with the badges. Some hot sauce. <laughs> facts, facts, facts. Cool. Yeah, I need to check that out. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to go get me a little eat, get me a little walk in today, man. I'm glad y'all joining me. Like I said, I'm going to do a lot more AWS stuff. Uh, the one thing I want to do is, and I'll probably get with Helmet or something, is um, a lot of AWS with uh, Active, Directory, Active Directory, they have the AFDS, which is the Active Directory in the cloud. A lot of people use that for uh outlook in the cloud you know they have the, uh, the suite microsoft suites in the cloud so a lot of people cook their own prem active directory to azure in the cloud a lot of people takes actually take aws and use afds to authenticate with bring back your permissions and your roles to active directory so you have them in one place so everybody's trying to do uh multi-cloud so i thought that was a interesting thing when i read it was the multi-cloud Good to cost of train live recording and getting LinkedIn from I didn't, I didn't know that. That's cool. Okay, I might <laughs> still protect I probably will. Um, um Gabe hates sticks, <laughs> struggle security hates sticks. So yeah, I probably do that. I probably do it with the CIS checks. That's a more and more prevalent. Um, and I'll do that with the uh Azure cyber checks. Long story, shout out to uh, Ty. He'll look in there. He's in there. Once you get uh, familiar with uh, IRS Pro 1075, they have some schisms, which is the IRS sticks. That's actually what you use to harden your, your infrastructure, harden your VMs, harden your Linux, harden your Active Directory. It's called schisms. 
that's the IRS's stigs, right? So I'm I'm familiar with both of those hardenings. So um so yeah, so um IRS got their hardenings, DOD's got their hardenings, business wants you to use CIS. So sometimes you got to use all three, pick the best one, and try to harmonize them all together. So I've done that before. Now I charge 10K to create a smart sheet workspace. Okay. I'm going to have to check that out. I don't know what that is. Oh, libraries giving it free LinkedIn learning? That's cool. I definitely didn't know that. So I'm going to shut it down. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Like I said, y'all see me more. Like I said, my comments niche is good. And <laughs> So, yeah, so um, I've been doing a lot of AWS, just trying to get get into that. It's going to be my next, hopefully my next and my last, give me my last 10 years, I slide in retirement. So I've really been working on my AWS and stuff. Uh, a lot of my colleagues are getting in AWS and doing AWS stuff on site. So um, so that's kind of the thing. Check out QuickBase, no code. Okay, cool. QuickBase is still around? I was doing QuickBase in... The 2000s, I thought. Maybe it's something different. I thought QuickBase was out of the 2000s. But once again, thanks for checking me out. Everybody have a great holiday. Um, everybody go subscribe to everybody. I'm sure everybody know Kev Tech in there. Check out my girl Erica. Uh, Network Bro was in here. Helmet Chili, game over. Uh, I just want to pre Adrian. Shout out to everybody for. For joining me, I, I'm surprised. I thought everybody would be busy and y'all would catch the replay out. Uh, thanks for joining me. Like I said, I'm gonna do a lot more, a lot more of these. Um, like I said, with AWS, um, like I said, I'm I think I'm gonna start doing more, and I, this is part of that more DevSecOps in AWS, uh, in cybersecurity, you know, and kind of rolling that up together. Um, with shout out to Tim with compliance, right. Because even though you do DevSecOps, the IRS wants you to do it a certain way. NIST wants you to do it a certain way. Um, DOD, FISMA wants you to do it a certain way. So compliance with all that roll together. What, what, what does that look like, right? Shout out to Erica. That's her LinkedIn. If y'all need her, I'll, I'll at least stay up in for a quick second so y'all can click on her, go join her. Um, she's doing big things. Uh, like I said, everybody have a good holiday. Um, get some rest. I'm sure everybody's going to be grinding. I'll be studying my <laughs> AWS security. Uh, so the next week I'll be doing a um, certification video. Shout out to the old people getting certifications. So I do it for <laughs> the certifications <laughs> for older people. So it'll be me. Mm. Uh, holiday, you're doing some good work. I appreciate you, Eric. I'll see you out there grinding. Everybody had a good holiday. I'm sure you'll see me around. Uh, shout out to Kev Tech. He's uh, doing all, <laughs> doing the most, doing the best, though. Like I said, he's. Uh, I know he's doing good work, so I always send people to him and, uh, and you know, send it to a ton of people. Uh, Network Bro, to Erica. They like the game. Once again, there's so many great channels and people out there doing good work. I'm out. Oh, people going to get some barbecue. Everybody have a nice holiday. <laughs>